Hey, loyal Smork Show listeners. Hey. Hey, welcome back, Allie. Hi. It's been so long. I'm getting back into the element here. The last time you and I did uh, a kickoff of a show was a year ago. <laughs> was it really? Was that um, release of another radio play, or what was it? Yeah, last Christmas we did uh, the letters for Cynthia. Letters That's from right. Cynthia. Yeah. A year. Yeah. But you did join us a few weeks ago. For, I made a cameo. <laughs> yeah, Dave and I had a little uh, jazz lounge kind of thing going here. Hey, you've stumbled upon the Smorg Show podcast, and we are presenting to you episode number 90. 90. We made it. Wow. We are 10 away from triple digits. Can you believe it? Yeah. And it's taken seven years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've been a little absent lately. But uh, we're getting fired up again. I've got the uh, creative bug again, so this is the second one in a month. <laughs> well, the good news is that every time we do come back, it's it's always something exciting we're announcing or putting out, or so it's it's never a letdown. I hope not. You know? So I think we've been pretty good about that lately. Is we, I, I hope we haven't disappointed. <laughs> well, it's Thanksgiving weekend here, and um, we're just. Ready to present another show for you. What are we going to do tonight, Allie? We are going to um, finally release uh, projects that we've been working on since probably August. <laughs> um, it's been a big production, but we are ready to uh, release our final production of Alfred Hitchcock's Rope, our uh, radio adaption of it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, this is a, well, you're going to hear all about it in here in just a few minutes, but started out being a play back in the 1920s and then Alfred Hitchcock adapted it for the big screen in the late forties. And, um, what can we say about it? We've been watching this movie now for many years and we've been looking for a new production to do our radio plays. We haven't found anything. So we thought, why don't we try to adapt a movie for radio? And see how that works. Yeah, and we're such huge Alfred Hitchcock fans that I think we always thought that it would be a Alfred Hitchcock would be a great like one of his movies would be great to look at because I mean suspense he's like the man of suspense you know and it but it was all just about choosing the right one because a lot of his movies are I mean cinematography based and like the visuals are important but um, I think what made this movie different his movie Rope which is his, was his first like big one, I think. Um, but what made it different was the movie was based off of a play. So it's dialogue heavy and it's, there's like no cuts in the movie other than when they need to change the reels. But um, I think it was purely just based on the concept and the dialogue more than the visuals. So it was like, okay, if we were going to pick an Alfred Hitchcock movie, this was the one to pick. Yeah. You, you brought up a good point there is if you ever watched this movie, um, his 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 um, goal was to, cry, to kind of do it in all in one take, but the limitations of real film, you know, the film uh, canister film or whatever you want to call that, was limited to about ten minutes, and then they had to change the the film. So in order to make that seamless transition from one reel to another, he would zoom into let's say the back of a sport jacket and then zoom out again, and that would be the place where it would actually cut. So mm. it was kind of interesting. But uh, back to your other point about trying to take that and make it into radio, it was a big challenge for us because there's a lot of visual stuff that goes on in the movie. So how right. do you translate so, that to radio? Well, that's the thing is, and this was the lesser visual of his movies. So, no, our first step was picking a movie that didn't have a lot of visuals, but it did have very crucial visuals that it's like, okay, that doesn't make sense over radio, how are we going to, you know, slightly rewrite some of the lines or, you know, take out some scenes that don't make sense, you know? So we did have to 
do that extra step and still adapting it to radio. It wasn't like we were just able to, you know, find the script and then just, you know, go off with it. Right. Yeah. And as we're reading it, we're thinking, does anybody that just hears what that's, what we're saying, are they going to be able to make sense of that? Are they going to be able to picture that? Mm -hmm. And the answer might be no. And we would have to rework the line or add a line to kind of bridge that that gap. Yeah, but I think I think we did a pretty good job. <laughs> yeah. Um, but just in case, I mean, we have um like on our website we, you know, have a description of it, um or just kind of a summary of it and we're going to have before we um play the production for you, uh we're going to have another kind of summary for you just so that you kind of know the subject matter and know what to be listening for instead of just, you know, starting to listen to this and you have no idea where it's going Mm because I think it can be hard if it's, you know, a long, a longer play to listen to. Exactly. So it is a, it is a very long production. Uh, The movie is normally, it's an hour and 20 minutes. We were able to get it down to about an hour and five minutes. It's a very long listen. So we understand that this is very demanding of a podcast audience. Um, So you may just want to, you know, when you're, you're ready to sit back, put in some headphones, just relax, kick back with a drink. Of course, we don't promote alcoholism on the show. But a Sprite. A Sprite would work. <laughs> Basically, just kick back and relax when you have time. It isn't an easy listen. You really have to pay attention to details. Mm-hmm. But we hope we have made this engaging enough with the sound effects and the atmosphere that we have added mm-hmm. that will um, will keep you... Engaged, I guess. So there is a lot. It is very. What's the word like auditorily? Uh, aud, what, what's the word audit? It's very. I'm trying to say it's very stimulating for your ear because there are a lot of cool things, you know, in there that really cool sounds that just kind of put you in the, the right atmosphere. Yeah. So it is a. So even though it's a long listen, and you do have to pay attention to detail, there are a lot of really cool things that just made this such a elaborate production and why it took us so long, but yeah, we're proud to release it. Yeah. So without further ado, let's move on to rope to keep this total show under an hour and a half, (laughs) which might be one of the longest ones we've had out there. So uh, enjoy. And we'll be back to close out uh, this episode once we're done. So enjoy. Enjoy. Welcome to another installment of Smog Show Theater, the program that is designed to deliver both thrills and chills. Normally, the Smog Show players reenact classic radio dramas, but in this episode, we aim to deliver something quite unusual. This time, we present to you a radio adaptation of Rope a 1948 American psychological crime thriller directed by Alfred Hitchcock. Based on the 1928 play of the same name by Patrick Hamilton. In our story, just before hosting a dinner party, Philip Morgan and Brandon Shaw strangle a mutual friend to death with a piece of rope, purely as a Nietzsche-inspired philosophical exercise hiding the body in a chest upon which they can arrange a buffet dinner the pair welcome their guests including the victim's oblivious fiance and the college professor whose lectures inadvertently inspired the killing so sit back grab a cocktail and enjoy our performance of rope I'm turning on the lights. Don't. We've got to see if there's anything we've missed. I know. But not just yet. Let's stay quiet this way for a minute. Philip, we don't have too much time. It's the darkness that's got you down. Nobody feels really safe in the dark. (laughs) Nobody's ever a child, that is. I'll open these curtains, all right? There. That's much better. (sighs) 
What a lovely evening. Pity we couldn't have done it with the curtains open and the bright sunlight. Well, we can't have everything, can we? We did do it in the daytime. Are you alright now, Philip? Yes. Good. You better put these gloves away. Put them in my checkbook drawer behind the metal box. You know, this glass is a museum piece now. We really should preserve it for posterity. Except it's such good crystal and I'd hate to break up the set. Out of this glass, David Kentley had his last drink. It should have been ginger ale or even beer. It was out of character for David to drink anything as corrupt as whiskey. Out of character for him to be murdered, too. <laughs> yes, wasn't it? Good Americans usually die young on the battlefield, don't they? Well, the Davids of this world merely occupy space, which is why he was the, the perfect victim for the perfect murder. Of course, he was a Harvard undergraduate. That might make it justifiable homicide. <laughs> he's dead. And we've killed him. But he's still here. Inside this trunk. And in less than eight hours, he'll be resting gently but firmly at the bottom of a lake. Meanwhile, he's here. Philip, what are you doing? The trunk. It's not locked. All the better. It's more dangerous. Anyway, this lock's too old. It won't work. I wish it would. I wish we had him out of here. I wish it were somebody else. It's a trifle late for that, don't you think? Whom would have you preferred? Kenneth? I don't know. I suppose anyone was as good. Or as bad as any other. You, perhaps. You frighten me. You always have. From that very first day in prep school. Part of your charm, I suppose. I'm only kidding, Brandon. I obviously can't take it as well as you, so I'm turning on you a little. That's rather foolish, isn't it? Yes, very. May I have a drink now? By all means, this is an occasion. It calls for champagne. Let's bring it out. Champagne? I put some in the icebox. When did you put it there? Just before David arrived. You were certain it would come off, weren't you? <laughs> of course. You know I never do anything unless I did it perfectly. I've always wished for more artistic talent. Well, murder can be art too. The power to kill can be just as satisfying as the power to create. Philip, do you realize we've actually done it? Exactly as we planned. Not a single infinitesimal thing has gone wrong. It was perfect. Yes. Immaculate murder. We've killed for the sake of danger and for the sake of killing. And we're alive. Truly and wonderfully alive, Philip. E even the champagne isn't equal to us or the occasion. I'll take it, though. You aren't frightened anymore, are you? You can't really have fear. Neither of us can. That's the difference between us and the ordinary man, Philip. They talk about committing the perfect crime, but nobody does it. Nobody commits a murder just for the experiment of committing it. Nobody except us. You're not frightened anymore, are you, Philip? No. Not even of me? No. That's good. You just astound me. As always. That's even better. Let's drink to David, of course. Brandon, how did you feel? When? During it. I don't know, really. I don't remember feeling very much of anything. Even while tightening the rope around his neck... Until his body went limp. And then I knew it was over. And then? And then I felt tremendously exhilarated. H how did you feel? Oh, I... I... Brandon, you don't think the party's a mistake, do you? No, Philip. The party is an inspired finishing touch to our work. It's more. It's, it's the signature of the artist. Why... Not having it would be like, uh... Painting the picture and not hanging it? <laughs> I don't think that's a very good choice of words. It may turn out to be a little too choice, thanks to the party. Rot. We have the food. The dining table is set. This party will be the most exciting ever given. With these people? Oh, they're a dull crew, all right. The Kenleys couldn't be duller if they tried. But we did have to have them. After all... They are David's mother and father. That doesn't make them any easier to talk to. Don't worry. 
Janet will be buttering them up, poor girl. She's banked everything on hooking Dafin, but somehow, I don't think she's going to succeed, <laughs> do you? No. Somehow, I don't. Well, she can switch back to Kenneth tonight. You must admit, it was most considerate of me in view of, uh... Oh, Philip. What? Here. Take the candlestick from the other end of the table. What for? Never mind. Come with me and bring that candlestick. What's all this about? <laughs> You'll see, it's brilliant. What the devil are you doing putting the candlesticks on top of the trunk? Making our work of art a masterpiece. Brandon, you're going too far. Why? What do you mean? I just thought it'd be nice to have supper in here. We can serve the food off from this trunk. We'll set it just like how Mrs. Wilson's at the dining room table. Only we'll be in here. Isn't it a good idea? Well, at least this way no one will try to open the trunk. I don't think you appreciate me, Philip. I'm beginning to, Brandon. Well, come on. We don't have much time. Let's move the tablecloth, plates, and silver in here. Mrs. Wilson will be back to the apartment soon. Oh, did you remember to take Mrs. Wilson's key? I remembered. I told her I lost mine, so she gave me hers. Oh, good. How are you going to explain the change in dinner tables to Mrs. Wilson? I'm not. We've got to have some excuse. We don't want to leave our guest of honor alone during supper. We've got to have an excuse. For the others. All right. Let me think then. Really, you get much too upset too easily, Philip. We have a very simple excuse. R right here, these books. After all, old Mr. Kentley is coming mainly to look at these books. What could be better than to have them laid out neatly on the dining room table instead of the trunk? Where the poor man can easily get at them. Consider it, aren't we? Hello? Oh, of course. Philip. You start laying out the books on the dining room table. Who is it? Mrs. Wilson. Brandon? Brandon! What the devil? Don't you have any more sense than to... Why are you staring at the trunk? What is it? The rope. It's hanging out of the trunk. Well, go on, yank it out. Can't. If Mrs. Wilson were here, she'd yank it out for you. A stupid display like that in front of someone else will be just as good as a confession! Take these plates and get a hold of yourself. If you had let me keep the light on before as I had wanted, I would have seen it hanging out. All right, you're perfect. We have to be, Philip. We agreed there was only one crime we could commit. The crime of making a mistake. Being weak is a mistake. Because it's being human? Because it's being ordinary. I wouldn't let either of us stoop to... You owe me two forty for taxis, including the tip. If it weren't for the traffic, I'd have been here half an hour ago. It's just as well. We didn't expect you back until now. I went to five stores for the special pate we like. But the prices, good grief. I didn't see any reason for throwing away good money, so I went downtown to that little delicatessen where Mr. Cadell goes. But I tell you, the next time we give a party, I'm only going to serve... Good evening, Mrs. Wilson. What, may I ask, is happening to my dining room table? We're just moving the things from the dining room table into the other room. Well, I personally thought my table was quite lovely. Oh, it was quite lovely. But Mr. Kentley is coming to look at these old books I had in the trunk. You wouldn't want the poor old man to have to get on his knees to see them. Well, I think it looks downright peculiar to serve dinner on a trunk instead of a table. Peculiar? Very peculiar. Particularly those candlesticks on that trunk. They don't belong there at all. On the contrary. I think they suggest a ceremonial altar, which you can heap with the foods for our sacrificial feast. Hmm. Heap is right. There just isn't enough room for me to set things out properly, is there, Mr. Philip? You can make do. You two will be the death of me. What's to be done with the books? We'll lay them out on the dining room table. It's a crazy idea, if you ask me. I have too much to do to discuss this thoroughly. I still think it's peculiar. Who serves a buffet from a trunk? Philip, what on earth is the matter? You look frightened. I was sure she'd notice. Notice what? The rope you're swinging in your hand, of course. We've got to hide it. Why? Why? Yes, why? It's only a piece of rope. An ordinary household article. Why hide it? It belongs in the kitchen drawer. Where I'm going to put it. Mrs. Wilson? Yes? 
There's champagne in the icebox. We're not giving them champagne. We are. Well, if it's going to be that kind of party, I'd better doll up. We only serve champagne at Mr. Cadell's on very high occasions. Matter of fact, he and I once had a glass together. On my birthday. Tonight, Mrs. Wilson, you'll have an opportunity to renew that romance. Mr. Cadell's coming. Oh my, Mr. Cadell is terribly nice. Rupert's coming? Yes, I thought I told you. No, you didn't. I'm going to put this in the icebox. I thought you liked Rupert. I do. Well, then... Of all the people on this earth, Rupert Cadell is the one man likely to suspect. He's the one man who might appreciate this from our angle. The artistic one. That's what's exciting. I'm glad it excites you. It frightens me. Keep your voice down. It would have been too easy with the others, Philip, and too dull. As for Rupert, I I once thought of inviting him to join us. Why didn't you? The more, the merrier. He hasn't the nerve. Oh, intellectually, he could have come along. He's brilliant, but he's a little too fastidious. He could have invented, and he could have admired, but he never could have acted. That's where we're superior, Philip. We have courage. Rupert doesn't. Philip, you've got your sleeve in the celery. Oh, the guests are here. Are we ready? Ready as we'll ever be. Philip, don't be so busy at the piano that you don't eat. You're getting too thin. And don't let them gobble up all that pate before you have any. Let's hope it's a success. I'll open the door. There wouldn't be this last-minute hustle-bustle if you'd kept my table. Now the fun begins. Hello, Kenneth. Come in. How are you, Brandon? Fine. Just put your hat there. Thank you. It's been quite a while. Yes, that's why I sounded so stupid on the phone. Surprised, I guess, when you invited me. Hello, Kenneth. Good to see you. You too. Been up to much lately? Oh, nothing to speak of. You? Trying to get ready for exams. I have to start cramming before everyone else. Say, am I the first to arrive? You are. Why is it I'm always too early at parties? Probably because you're always on time. Mrs. Wilson, champagne? Oh, it... It's someone's birthday, is it? Don't look so worried, Kenneth. It's really almost the opposite. The opposite? Philip's bidding the world a temporary farewell. I'm driving him to Connecticut. Oh? Where are you going? Just to Brandon's mother's place for a few weeks. I'm to be locked up. What? To make sure he practices six hours a day. I finally wrangled a debut for him. At Town Hall at that. That's wonderful. I hope you knock him dead. Thank you. Hey, I feel pretty honored. Oh? Why? Well... It looks like a pretty small farewell party. Well, we're really killing two birds with one stone. The party's also for Mr. Kentley. David's father? Yes. Oh. Is David going to be here? Of course. Who else is coming? Oh, no one you don't know. If that's what's bothering you. The Kentleys, Janet Walker... Janet? Yes, I thought you'd be glad to see her. Won't you be? Brandon, Janet and I are all washed up. Didn't you know? I'm sorry, I didn't. Well, you knew, Philip. I heard vague rumors, but I never pay attention to that sort of thing. I wish you had. Why? Well, you see, Janet and David are... Cheer up. I have the oddest feeling your chances with the lady are better than you think. Hello, ducks. Janet! Angel, be careful of my hair. It took hours. You smell dreamy. What is it? That swill you gave me last Christmas. I knew I had good taste. You do. You look lovely. I won't by the time it's all paid for. (laughs) Was that funny? I never know when I'm being funny. Whenever I try to be, I lay the bomb of all time. Philip, sweet. Hello. Say, what's this rumor I hear about you in Town Hall? I bet you're going to play a foul trick on all of us and become horribly famous. Hello, Ken. I believe you've met. Hello, Jan. That was fascinating, wasn't it? I seem to have run down. What would you say to some champagne? Hello, champagne? You see what I mean about trying to be funny? How have you been, Ken? Fine, thanks. How's the new job? What are you doing? Writing that same dreary column on how to keep the body beautiful. For whom this time? Oh, for an untidy little magazine called Allure. Thanks a lot, Brandon. Say, Brandon, isn't that painting new? Yes, it is. Do you like it? Well, what is it? A new young American primitive. I have a new young American sister. She's only three and her stuff is really primitive. (laughs) You dirty dog. Why? 
Didn't I notice another new one when I came in? I don't think so. Which? This one in the foyer. Come here. I could really strangle you, Brandon. What have I done now? At times, your sense of humor is a little too malicious, chum. What are you chattering about? Why did you invite Kenneth? Well, why not? You know perfectly well why not. We called it quits ages ago, and I'm practically engaged to his best friend. David? Yes, David. Which makes everything just ginger peachy. I'm terribly sorry, but it is difficult trying to keep up with your romances. After me came Kenneth, now it's David. Why the switch from Kenneth to David, anyway? Obviously, I think he's nicer. Well, he's certainly richer. That's a new low, even for you, chum. Hey, Brandon, I hear Rupert's coming. He was invited, but you never know with Rupert. I hope he does come. How is he? Who is he? Rupert Cadell was our housemaster at prep school. Housemaster for you three little dears? Four little dears. He tried valiantly to teach David, too. Rupert's a publisher now, isn't he? Successful? Maybe he can give me a job. Rupert only publishes books he likes. Usually philosophy. Oh. Small print, big words, no sales. Right. Rupert's extremely radical. Do you know that he selects his books on the assumption that people not only can read but actually think? Curious fellow, but I like him. He always did. Golly, those bull sessions you and Rupert used to have in school. Brandon would sit up till all hours at the master's feet. Brandon? At someone's feet? Who is this Rupert? He used to tell you the weirdest things. Really? What sort of things? I suppose Kenneth means Rupert's impatience with social conventions. For example, he thinks murder is a crime for most men, but a privilege for the few. It's all right, Mrs. Wilson. I'll answer the door. Mr. Kentley! I'm so glad you could come. Thank you, Brandon. Mrs. Kentley isn't well, so I took the liberty of bringing my sister-in-law, Mrs. Atwater. She's been staying with us. Delighted to have you, Mrs. Atwater. Delighted to come, dear boy. I've been in New York for two weeks. Alice has been ill almost the whole time, and Henry is forever cataloging his library. Oh, no, Anita. Occasionally. I even read some of my books. But I'm on a visit, Henry, and this is just my second party. Of course, I suppose it is only fair. Let me take your things, dear. Thank you. I'm sorry to hear Mrs. Kendley is ill. Oh, it's just a cold. Colds can be very dangerous this time of year. I hope Mrs. Kentley is staying in bed with lots of fruit juice. She is, thank you. That'll do the trick. Colds? Dangerous? In this heat? I don't understand that at all. Exactly two years ago this summer, I had one myself. I was down for three weeks. The doctors were ready to give up when- Excuse me. This way, Mrs. Atwater. David! Where? No. You've been a mistake. This is Kenneth Lawrence. Oh, forgive me. It's all right, Anita. Kenneth is often mistaken for David, even by people who aren't nearsighted. Kenneth, we haven't had much opportunity to observe the resemblance lately, my boy. Been studying, have you? I've been trying to, sir. The resemblance is only physical. I believe you both know Miss Walker. Janet, my dear, I finished working out your horoscope just before we left. Oh, tell. The stars are very kind. They indicate a marriage very soon to a tall, blonde young man with a very lovely father. Now, Anita, I told you all that a week ago. Well, I suppose you did. But the stars confirm it. Wonderful. Mrs. Atwater, may I present Mr. Philip Morgan? How do you do? Nice to meet you, Mrs. Atwater. May I get you some champagne? Oh, I should adore some. Daddy used to have a glass every morning at 11. But of course, Henry... Mr. Kendley, may I get you some? I'd prefer a little scotch with a lot of water, if you don't mind. Brandon, isn't David here? I expected him to come with you. He called and said he'd meet us here. Where did he call from? Our maid spoke to him. He was probably at the club studying. The trouble with David is he doesn't have to study. He's too bright. Well, he does all right. Very much so. How's Mrs. Kentley? As usual, it's a cold this time. I hope David arrives soon. She wants him to call her. He's her only child, Mr. Kentley. He's my only child, too. But I'm willing to let him grow up. Why don't I call and tell her that he's been detained? Oh, you mustn't pamper her. David might even have stopped off to see her. Brandon, may I use the phone? Of course. It's in my bedroom. How cozy. Aren't you ready for another drink? 
I will be as soon as I finish this drink. Okay, I am ready. Thank you. What a charming young man. I wish David saw more of him. Yes, I'll go and call. Kenneth, there's too much air in your glass. Mine's fine. Thanks. Would you mind taking this drink into Janet? Sure. Why? No particular reason. It's her reason I thought you might like to take it to her. She's in the bedroom. Telephoning. And then you'd like David to walk in. No, that would be too much of a shock. Are you going to play the piano, Philip? How lovely! Your wife sends her love. David wasn't there? No. He'll probably be here in a minute, though. Your touch has improved, Philip. Rupert! I, I was beginning to think you weren't going to show. You know me better than that. Mrs. Atwater, may I present Mr. Rupert Cadell? Delighted. Mr. Kentley? Thank you. How do you do, Mr. Kentley? Rupert Cadell, the housemaster at Somerville? I used to be. Then you must have taught my son David. You flatter me. How do you do? Hello, chum. Oh, Miss Walker. How did you know? Brandon's spoken of you. Did he do me justice? Do you deserve justice? Well... Why, little Kenneth Lawrence, how you've grown. Hello. Uh... Kenneth, school's out. You can say it. <laughs> Rupert, you're the same as ever. It's awfully good to see you again. Why? Uh, well... Don't mind me. I'm very pleased to see you again. And that bears a curious resemblance to champagne. It is. And such good champagne. What's the occasion? I, I told you over the phone. It began as a little party for, for Mr. Kentley, so he could look over the first editions. Then it turned out Philip and I were going up to the country tonight. You told me that too, Brandon. Did I? Yes. Well, I, I thought I'd make it a farewell for Philip. Therefore, champagne. Yes. I see. Well, it's true. You always did stutter when you were excited. I, I guess I'm always excited when I give a party. Really? Mr. Cadell. Mrs. Wilson. I got that special pate you like. I don't like it anymore. Oh, no. No, I'm just teasing. You're awful. Thank you. You'd better get along with the carving of the chicken. They will be ready to eat in two shakes. Oh, Mr. Brandon. I found it. I have the least notion what it was she lost. Wonderful Mrs. Wilson. I may marry her. The food looks heavenly. I hope David gets here soon. Yes, where is David? I haven't the faintest idea, but he's so late and Mr. Kentley's getting annoyed. And you? Me? I'm hungry. Exactly what is this, Brandon? A chest I got in Italy. No, I mean, why are we eating off it? Oh, I've turned the dining room into a library. Trust you to find a new use for a chest. One was always turning up in the bedtime stories he told in prep school. The mistletoe bow, that was your favorite tale, wasn't it? What was that one about? Oh, I don't quite remember how it started. It was about a lovely young girl. She was a bride-to-be, and on her wedding day, she playfully hid herself in a chest. Yes, that's right. Unfortunately, it had a spring lock. Fifty years later, they found her skeleton in the trunk. I don't think I'll get that playful. Would you all please help yourselves to the food? Talking of skeletons, have you seen that new thing at the Strand? Yes, I adored it. Did you? Good. I didn't like that new girl much. Definitely Scorpio. No, I didn't like her either. Oh, but her clothes were fabulous. Simply divine. Absolute heaven. I must see it. Of course, the man I have a passion for is James Mason. Is he good? Absolutely terrific. So attractively sinister. Taurus the bull, you know. Very obstinate. Really? But I have a confession to make. Do you know, I think I like Mason as much as Errol Flynn. I'll take Harry Grant myself. Ooh, so will I. Capricorn the goat, he leaps divine. So much oomph. Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. He was thrilling with Bergman. What was it called? Something of the something. No, that's the other one. This was just plain something. You know, it was sort of... You know. It's right on the tip of my tongue. Mine too. It was just plain something, I'm sure. I adored it. And Bergman. Oh, she's the Virgo type. Like all these, you know. Oh, I think she's lovely. I once went to the movies. 
I saw Mary Pickford. I was mad about her. Didn't you love her? Oh, I don't know. Virgo type, rather. Like all of these, you know. Yes, but what did you see her in? I can't quite recall. The something, something, or was it just plain something, I think. Or something like that. Something very like it, anyway. I don't believe you ever went. Janet, if I were you, I'd go easy on the pate, dear. Calories. Philip, would you mind helping Mrs. Atwater? I'd be glad to. Sit down, Mrs. Atwater. I'll bring a plate of food to you. Thank you so much, dear boy. I must apologize for David. I can't think what's keeping him. He's only in town for the weekend, Mr. Kentley. And David is a very popular young man. Here, Philip, let me help. White or dark meat? A little of both on this plate for Mrs. Atwater. What about you? I don't eat chicken. How queer. I never heard of anyone who didn't eat chicken. Did you, Brandon? Oh, you probably did. Why don't you eat it, Philip? I just don't. There must be a reason. Freud says there's a reason for everything, even me. There's no reason, Janet. As I remember, you have a very funny reason, doesn't he, Brandon? Yes. I knew there had to be one. What is it? Oh, it's nothing too much. I think it's quite fascinating. Come on, Brandon, please. Well, it happened about three years ago in Connecticut. Mother has a farm on her place there, you know. We were going to have chickens, so we walked over to the farm. It was a lovely Sunday morning in late spring. Across the valley, the church bells were ringing. And in the yard, Philip was doing likewise the necks of two or three chickens. Oh, dear. It was a task he usually performed very competently. But on this particular morning, his touch was perhaps a trifle too delicate because one of the subjects for our dinner table suddenly rebelled. Like Lazarus, he rose from the... That's a lie. Philip! There isn't a word of truth in the whole story. I never strangled a chicken in my life. Just because... I never strangled a chicken, and you know it. (laughs) Forgive me, but it just seemed very funny, you two being so intense about an old dead chicken. Sorry. We were ridiculous and very rude. I apologize for the both of us. And the story. Is it all over? I'm afraid so, Rupert. What a pity. In a moment, you might have been strangling each other instead of a chicken. Mr. Cadell, really? Well, a man's honor was at stake. And personally, I think a chicken is as good a reason for a murder as a blonde, a mattress full of dollar bills, or any of the customary unimaginative reasons. Now, you don't really approve of murder, Rupert, if I may. You may, and I do. Think of the problems it would solve. Unemployment, poverty, standing in line for theater tickets. I must say, I've had a perfectly dreadful time getting tickets for that new musical. What's it called? You know. The something with what's-her-name. My dear Mrs. Atwater, careful application of the trigger finger and a pair of seats in the front row is yours for the shooting. And have you had any difficulty getting into our Velvet Rope restaurants? Frightful. A very simple matter. A flick of the knife, madame, and if you'll kindly step this way. No, step over the head waiter's body. Thank you, and here's your table. <laughs> Rupert, you're the end. There's a hotel clerk I could cheerfully flick a knife at. Sorry, knives may not be used on hotel employees. They are in the death by slow torture category. Along with bird lovers, small children, and tap dancers. Landlords, of course, are quite another matter. You seeking an apartment? Call on our Miss Sashwaite of the Blunt Instrument Department. What a divine idea. If it suits your purpose, merely. But wait, then we'd all be murdering each other. Oh no, after all, murder is or should be an art. Not one of the seven lively, perhaps, but an art nevertheless. As such, the privilege of committing it should be reserved for those few who are really superior individuals. And the victims... Inferior beings whose lives are unimportant anyway. Obviously. Mind you, I don't hold with the extremists who feel there should be open season for murder all year round. No, I personally would prefer having cut a throat week, or strangulation day, or... Probably a symptom of approaching senility. But I must confess I don't really appreciate this morbid humor. The humor was unintentional. But you're not serious about these theories. Of course he is. You're both pulling my leg. No. Why would you think that? Well, Brandon, the notion that murder is an art which superior beings should be allowed to practice... In season. (laughs) Now I know you're not serious. But I am. I'm a very serious fellow. 
Then may I ask you who is to decide if a being is inferior and is therefore a suitable victim for murder? Well, the few who are privileged to commit murder. And just who might they be? Oh, myself, Philip, possibly Rupert. I'm sorry, Kenneth, you're out. Oh. I'm serious, gentlemen. So are we, Mr. Kentley. The few are those men of such intellectual and cultural superiority that they are above the traditional moral concepts. Good and evil, right and wrong, were invented for the ordinary average man, the inferior man, because he needs them. So you agree with Nietzsche and his theory of the Superman? Yes, I do. So did Hitler. Hitler was a paranoid savage. His supermen, all fascist supermen, were brainless murderers. I'd hang any who were left. But then I'd hang them first for being stupid. I'd hang all incompetents and fools. There are far too many in the world. Well, perhaps you should hang me, Brandon, because I am so stupid that I cannot tell if you are serious or not. In any case, I would rather not hear any more of your, forgive me, contempt for humanity and for the standards of a world that I believe is civilized. Civilized? Yes. Perhaps what is called civilization is hypocrisy. Perhaps. I'm sure Rupert, fortunately, has the intelligence Gentlemen, and imagination really, to- I... Please, Brandon, I think we've had just about enough. Philip, where did you put those books you set out for Mr. Kentley? I'd like to see them myself, if I may. Of course. They're in the dining room. Mr. Kentley, wouldn't you like to see the books now? I apologize, Mr. Kentley, sir. I'm afraid I let myself get carried away. Oh, uh, that's quite all right, my boy. I think it's a good collection of first editions, I mean. Yes, I I'd like to see them. May I use the telephone first? I'd like to call my wife. She may have some word of David. Of course, it's this way. Brandon? Yes? You are pushing your point rather hard. You aren't planning to do away with a few inferiors by any chance. <laughs> I'm a creature of whim, who knows? Mrs. Atwater, wouldn't you like to see the books? Oh, indeed, yes. I'd love to. Do you know, when I was a girl, I used to read quite a bit. Oh, we all do strange things in our childhood. Oh, Kenneth, why don't you switch on the radio or play some records? Atmospheric music goes a long way. He's such a sly little devil, isn't he? Bringing us back together with sweet music. Don't let it get to you. He's always doing something like this. I'm going in the other room. To see the books? No, to let Brandon see me. Do you care what he thinks? I know what he thinks. He thinks I threw you over because David has a bigger bank account. Then why do you go in there? Because... Because I'm embarrassed at being here with you. Oh, Janet. Never thought I could be, did you? Honestly? No. Well, I am, and I don't like it one bit. I should think you'd have the decency to be embarrassed yourself. Why? Well, you threw me over, chum, remember? My wooden friend Brandon loved to know that. What's the matter? Nothing. I'm just thinking. What about? Female vanity. Well, I'm also embarrassed because... Go on. Well, you and David used to be such good friends. You're not now, and it's my fault. I'm such an idiot, girl. No, you're not then I'm certainly giving a good imitation of one. Why must I try and be so smart with everyone but David? Don't you kid with David, too? I relax with David. Thanks to you. To me? Yes. That... that grim Sunday at Harvard when you called it quits. David took me for a walk. My chin was about an inch from the ground. I just couldn't be the gay girl. I just relaxed and let everything pour out. The real, real me stuff. Did you hear that phrase? I hear myself saying things like that and... Oh, where's David? You know, I'm not very smart. Why? I never realized you were... Brandon and his atmospheric music. You are in love with David, aren't you? Yes. I don't get it. Brandon made a crack when I got here. He implied I'd have a chance with you again because David's out of the running. Wait... You mean before I got here, Brandon knew we had broken up? He even knew about you and David. What? Kenneth, he pretended to be completely ignorant when I told him. He said- What's going on here? I don't know, but I'm going to find out once and for all. Brandon. Yes? May I see you for a moment? Certainly. Why can't he keep his hands off people? Well- Just exactly what are you up to? Up to getting you a coffee, if you'd like. Let's dispense with the charm. 
I'd like to know why you had the gall to tell Kenneth he wouldn't have to worry much longer about David and me. I don't think that's precisely what I said, Kenneth. It's what you implied, and I want to know why. Some women are quite charming when they're angry, Janet. Unfortunately, you're not. Cut that out, Brandon. Chivalry rears its ugly head. I don't believe David's coming. Wait and see. I don't have to. He's never this late. He's never late at all. If something had come up, he'd have phoned. I think you deliberately arranged it so that he wouldn't come. How clever of me. I might have known you couldn't just give a party for Mr. Kentley. You'd have to add something that appealed to your warped sense of humor. I hope you've enjoyed yourself, Brandon. I haven't. Something gone wrong, Brandon? No, Janet has a talent for being bothersome at times. However, I suppose I'd better... Uh, what did you mean, something gone wrong? You always plan your parties so well, it's odd to have anything go wrong. She seems to be missing David. As a matter of fact, I'm beginning to miss him myself. Aren't we all? I'm going to help Mr. Kentley with his books. Two desserts, Mr. Cadell? One for you and one for me, my love. The others don't seem to be in the mood for ice cream. Well, they could all do with a little cooling off. My, it's a peculiar party. Not that that surprises me. Why not? I could have predicted it this morning. Both of them must have got up out of the wrong side of the bed. They've been in quite a state all day. Mr. Brandon says he's always in a state when he gives a party. First time I've seen it. Usually he lets me prepare everything my own way. But look at this. The chicken's hardly been touched. What was so different today? What wasn't? Mr. Brandon was in the maddest rush for me to clean up and get the table set. And it looked so lovely. But when I was whisking out to do shopping, he suddenly told me to take the whole afternoon for it. The whole afternoon? After that mad rush in the morning. Did he say why? No, just a whim, I suppose. But when I came back, he and Mr. Philip were going at it hammer and tongs. Oh? What about? Even if I did know, do you think I'd tell? Well, I hope so. Not me. I'm like the grave. Look at this mess. Just makes double the work. After I have this cleaned off, I have to clear all those books off the dining room table, bring them in here, put them back in the chest, which is where they were in the first place. Why did you serve from here anyway? It wasn't my idea. I had everything laid out in the dining room, and it was just beautiful. On this trunk, it doesn't have half the room. We couldn't even put the flowers on it. Is she still harping on her table and how awkward it is to serve from this chest? It's much more convenient, you know. Because this way, people don't have to go all the way into the dining room to get food and then come all the way back to eat it. Seems to me they've gone there now for their dessert and coffee. Mrs. Wilson, please, serve the guests. Don't lecture them. We did get up on the wrong side of the bed, didn't we? I'm in quite an embarrassing position, Philip. How do you mean? I seem to be the only one having a good time. You and Mrs. Atwater. What's going on, Philip? Would you mind turning that lamp off? Sorry. I don't like the light in my eyes while I'm playing. You know, Philip, I get quite intrigued when people don't answer questions, and quite curious. Did you ask me a question? Yes, Philip, I asked you a question. Well, what was it? I asked you what is going on here. A party. Yes, but a rather peculiar party. What's it all about, Philip? What's what all about? Stop playing crime and punishment, Rupert. If you want to know something, come out with it. Otherwise... Now, now, Temper. Don't stop playing. I'd like a drink. I'll get it for you. Keep playing. What would you like, Scotch? No, Brandy. You're very fond of that little tune, aren't you? You know, I wish I could come straight out with what I want to know. Unfortunately, I don't know anything. I merely suspect. I said... I heard you. Thank you for the drink. Do you use this metronome? Sometimes. I thought only beginners did. I must say... All right, Rupert. I'll ask you. What do you suspect? Oh, I've forgotten. But where's David, Philip? I don't know. Why? Brandon knows. Does he? Doesn't he? Not that I know of. Oh, come now. I don't. Why don't you ask Brandon? I have, but he's too busy maneuvering the other two points of the triangle. What for, Philip? 
Just what is Brandon trying to do with Janet and Kenneth? <laughs> what are you laughing at? Nothing. <laughs> what is it? What, am I so far off the track? There's nothing going on at all, Rupert. You're a more than usually allergic to the truth tonight, Philip. That's the second time you haven't told it. Thanks. When was the first? When you said you'd never strangled a chicken. You're confused. Brandon dreamt that up for the sake of a very unfunny joke. No, he didn't, Philip. And if you'll think back carefully, you'll realize that I know he didn't. About a year ago, I was up at the farm, remember? One morning, I saw you display your handiwork. You're quite a good chicken strangler, as I recall. Well, I... I just meant that Brandon's story wasn't true. I didn't mean that I hadn't killed chickens. But that's what you said. Well, I didn't think it was a suitable topic for conversation while we were eating. You could have said that. All right, I didn't. We're not eating now, Philip. Why did you lie to me? Because I don't like to talk about... About what? Strangling chickens? I can't play with that thing! I want you to have these books. It's extremely generous of you, Brendan. I don't... Please. I know you appreciate first editions more than I, Mr. Kentley. It's very nice of you. Philip, what's wrong? You look upset. You and Philip must come to dinner very soon. I'll get David to fix the day. What's wrong, Philip? Don't you want Mr. Kentley to have the books? No, I don't care that he has them. I just... What? What? I just think it's a clumsy way of tying them up, that's all. Tying them up with that rope is just clumsy. Oh? You called Alice a little while ago, didn't you, Henry? Yes. And no word from David? No. I don't think you really ought to worry. David's never had trouble taking care of himself. I know, but I can't understand this. Whatever he's been detained before, he telephones us. Isn't that so, Janet? Oh, yes. I remember once when David was still at home. Take it easy, Philip. Rupert's onto something. He isn't. Let up. I've got to have a drink. You've had enough. Take your hand off my arm. Don't you ever again tell me what to do and what not to do. I don't like it. And I'm not keeping your voice down. I, uh, hope I didn't upset Philip. Oh, no. He's more likely mixing his drinks. You seem rather upset yourself. Do I? Yes. There's something upsetting both of you a great deal. Something that... Excuse me, there's a lady phoning for either Mr. Kentley or Mrs. Atwater. Oh, it must be Alice. I'll talk to her, Henry. All right. Down the hall and to your left, dear, in the first bedroom. Thank you. Mr. Kentley, do you suppose David could be at home? I don't know, Janet. I hope so. I hate to throw a damper, but if David was home, I think he'd be calling instead of Mrs. Kentley. Wouldn't you say so, Brandon? I wouldn't know. The David I remember was polite as well as punctual. He hasn't changed. Of course, if he's not home, where could he be? Don't ask me. I, I don't know. He might be at any number of places. Such as? The club, or the Bradleys are having a party. Why, he might have even gone down to Janet's. Why? Perhaps he decided to pick her up after all. I phoned my place after I spoke to Mrs. Kentley. He wasn't there? No, I left a message just in case. We might have a better chance of finding out where he is now if we knew where he was this afternoon. What do you think, Brandon? I have the least idea where he was this afternoon. Don't you think it would help if we found out where he was? I suppose so. I know Dave was going to the club to play tennis this afternoon, and I know he got there. Why? Because someone phoned from the club with a message that David would meet us here. Do you know who? No. Obviously, David ran into somebody at the club and then changed plans. You weren't there this afternoon, were you, Kenneth? No. I wish I had been. I don't suppose you or Brandon were there, Philip? No. Hardly. We had our hands full getting ready for the party. Oh, there was a lot to be done this afternoon? You know. Yes, I see. You didn't speak to David at all today? No. Why do you ask? I thought he might have called to say he'd be late or something. He didn't. Neither Philip nor I have talked to David since we invited him to the party. That's odd. What do you mean? I thought I heard David on the phone to Philip yesterday morning. Oh, yes, you did. I'd forgotten. Oh? What were you talking about? Did he call about the party? Yes, he wanted to make sure about the time. That was all. Here, Mrs. Wilson, let me help you with putting away those books into the trunk. Thank you, Mr. Cadell. Could you open the trunk for me? That's all right, Mrs. Wilson. You can put the books back when you come to clean in the morning. I didn't have any idea of coming in in the morning. I'm afraid you'll have to. Just let the books go for now. Well, all right. Henry, Alice hasn't had a word from David. She's frantic. I'd better talk to her. She hung up. She began to cry so badly. Oh, Henry, I'm worried. What did she say? 
She's called every place he might be, not once, but several times. And now, Henry, she thinks he may have had an accident. She wants you to call the police. The police? Oh, no, Anita, I don't think that's necessary. David's no longer a child. I'm sure he's quite all right. I, Brandon, I think I'd better go home. My wife needs me, and this isn't like David. I understand. May I go with you, Mr. Kentley? Thank you, Janet. I'll get your things. Oh, Mr. Kentley, don't forget your books. Oh, yes, thank you. I can't tell you how sorry I am. Would you call me as soon as you hear from David? Yes. I'm sure the dear boy will turn up somehow. Janet? Yes? This is hardly the time, but I'm glad we had that talk. So am I. And David will be, too. Good. Well... Kenneth, why don't you come with us? Oh, I... I don't know. Please. Thanks. This coat's yours, Janet? Yes, I'll just carry it. Oh, thanks for the party. I'll get my hat. Oh, going with Janet? Yes. We're all going together. What did I predict? Good night, Mr. Kendley. I hope Mrs. Kendley feels better soon. Thank you. You will call me the moment you hear from David? Yes, I will. Mrs. Atwater, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for letting me come. I'm so sorry we have to leave. Good night. Good night. I'll get your hat, Mr. Cavell. I'm very sorry we had to spoil the evening. You couldn't possibly spoil it, Mr. Kentley. I mean by leaving so early. Good night. Be careful of those stairs, Anita. Mr. Cadell, that hat can't be yours. It's too small. Oh, you're right. Those aren't my initials inside the hat. D.K. Good night, Mr. Cadell. Good night. Here's your hat, Mr. Cadell. Thank you, Mrs. Wilson. Oh, you're going too? Yes, I must. Good night. Good night. Oh, may I help you with those books, Mr. Kentley? Thank you for a lovely evening. Good night. It's been charming. <laughs> oh, Philip, this party really deserves to go down in history. Well, come on. It's over. It couldn't have gone more beautifully. Yes, it could, without Rupert. But he was brilliant. He helped me say all I wanted to say to those idiots. He gave the party the very touch I predicted. The touch of what? Prying? Snooping? Or just plain pumping? Do you know how busy he was questioning me? About what? Well, what's the difference? You were busy in there arranging that other little touch of yours. What touch? Tying up the books with that rope. Oh, I thought that was wonderful. Didn't you like it? No, Brandon. I didn't like it one bit. You'll ruin everything with your neat little touches. Be quiet. Mrs. Wilson's still here. Determined to get drunk, aren't you? I am drunk. And just as childish as you were before when you called me a liar. You had no business telling that story. Why did you lie anyway? I had to! Have you ever bothered for one minute to understand how someone else might feel? I'm not sentimental if that's what you mean. That's not what I mean. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters except that Mr. Brandon liked the party. Mr. Brandon gave the party. Mr. Brandon had a delightful evening. Well, I had a rotten evening. Keep drinking, you'll have a worse morning. At least if I have a hangover, it will be all mine. You know, Philip, I've been thinking. We deserve a real holiday after it's all over. Where would you like to go? Of course, we should come back here for a few days first. Otherwise, it might look- I've been praying I'd wake up and find we hadn't done it yet. But why? I'm scared to death, Brandon. I think we're going to get caught. Oh, there's not a chance. Well, there was, but not anymore. Why, we're pro- uh, is that you, Mrs. Wilson? Yes, I'm leaving now. I'll need a key to get in and clean up in the morning. That is, if you're still driving to the farm tonight. Oh, we're driving up, all right. Oh, that's good. You don't look too well, either one of you. Here's the key. Thank you. Of course, I could do with the rest myself, but I want both of you to come back in tip-top shape. We will. Well, I'm off. Enjoy yourselves. Don't forget to write. And mind your P's and Q's. Who are you calling? Only the garage. Hello? This is Mr. Brandon Shaw. Would you send my car around, please? Yes. Right away. Thank you. We'd better draw the curtains before we open that trunk. Who's that, Brandon? Probably the garage man. Answer it. There hasn't been time for him to get here. 
Then maybe Mrs. Wilson forgot something. Answer it. Brandon. Brandon, couldn't we pretend we're not home? With all these lights on? Answer it, Philip. Who is it? Brandon. Brandon, it's Rupert. What? He wants to come up. He says he left his cigarette case here. Well, let him come. You know he's lying. He's caught on. Shut up and get back to the phone. I won't. Get back to the phone. Brandon, I can't. You've got to. No, he knows. Shut up! <clears throat> Rupert? Come on up. No, uh, of course not. He's just a little tight. No, but we'll find it in no time. Right. Philip, listen to me. Rupert's on his way up now, and you've got to pull yourself together. Philip, do you hear me? Come on, have another drink if you must, but get a hold of yourself and keep your mouth shut. It'll be over in five minutes. I don't know how much, if anything, Rupert knows, but I promise you he'll be out of here in five minutes, one way or the other. Philip, for those five minutes, you've got to pull yourself together. Brandon. Brandon. Now look! I'm not going to get caught because of you or anyone else! No one is going to get in my way now! Brandon, is that gun loaded? Is it? Shh. Sorry to bother you, Brandon. It's no bother. Come in. I knew you were leaving tonight. I didn't want to be left without my cigarette case. Hello, Philip. Hello. I didn't mean to alarm you before. You didn't alarm him. I'm afraid Philip's a little antisocial tonight. Oh? I thought perhaps... Any idea where you left the case? No. No, not at all. Completely unlike me to forget it, isn't it? I suppose a psychoanalyst would say that I really didn't forget it at all. I unconsciously left it because I wanted to come back. But, uh, why should I want to come back? Yes, why? For the pleasure of our company. Or another drink. That's a good idea. May I have one for the road? Of course. A short one? No, I'd prefer a long one, if you don't mind. Not at all. Philip, will you fix Rupert a drink? Now, let me see. The last I remember having the case was when I was there. I was just going to open the chest for Mrs. Wilson when you came over, Brandon. But then what? I think I, um... wonder where it could be. Oh, well, here it is, right where I left it. Say, what do you know? Gentlemen, I beg your pardon. I'm very sorry. Well, uh, may I have that drink anyway? Of course. You really don't mind? No. Why should we? Well, you might be... What? Tired. You're sure it's all right? He said you could have it. Thank you. Don't mind, Philip. I'm afraid he's uh, had a few too many. Why not? After all, it was a party. Well, it's very pleasant to sit here with a good drink and good company. I'm glad. Please don't let me be in the way. Of what? Well, I know you have things to do. What do you mean? Packing, last-minute odds and ends. You are driving up to Connecticut tonight, aren't you? Yes, but we're all packed. Oh, I see. Already. All except one guest who must be gotten rid of. Well, I'll be off as soon as... as soon as I finish my drink. There's no need to hurry, Rupert. Thank you. I would like to stay a bit. Perhaps even see you off. I always hate to leave a party, especially when the evening has been... Unusually stimulating or strange like this evening. What do you mean, strange? Did I say strange, Brandon? You often pick words for sound rather than meaning. I don't exactly know what I meant, unless I was thinking about David. What was strange about David? His not showing up. You don't think anything really did happen to him, do you? What could have? He could have been run over or held up. In broad daylight? Hmm. Yeah, that's right, I've forgotten. Yes, it must have been broad daylight when it happened. When, uh, what happened? When whatever did happen to David. Nothing, probably. Still, where is he? What's your theory? Mine? I was considering Janet's for the moment. Oh, I didn't know she had one. Yes, you do. I couldn't help overhearing Janet. I gather she thinks you kidnapped David or did something to prevent him from coming. I'm not interested in Janet's prattle, but you always interest me, Rupert. Do you think I kidnapped David? 
Well, it's the sort of mischief that would have appealed to you in school for the experience, the excitement, the danger. But it would be slightly more difficult to pull off now, though, don't you think? You'd find a way. How? I mean, suppose you were I. How would you get David out of the way? You're much better at this sort of thing than I am. But what would you do if you were I? Well, if I wanted to get rid of David, I'd invite him for a drink at the club or some quiet bar. Or better still, I'd invite him here. Then no one would see us together. That's good. No witnesses? Yes, that's right. Then what? Well, well, let me see. At the appointed time, David would arrive. I'd walk slowly into the hall. I'd greet him tell him how fine he's looking and so forth, and uh, take his hat. Then I'd bring him in here, make some small talk to put him at ease, probably offer him a drink, and then he'd sit down. I'd try to make it all very pleasant, you understand? Yes. Philip would probably play the piano. Now, as I recall, David was quite strong. He'd have to be knocked out. So I'd move quietly around behind the chair and hit him on the head with something. His body would fall forward on the floor. Then where would you put him? Well, uh, let me see. Well, I think I'd get Philip to help me carry him out of the room, down the back stairs, and the two of us would put him out into the car. You'd be seen. What? You said yourself that if anything did happen, it must have happened in broad daylight. Oh, that's right. I'd forgotten. That means I'd have to find some place to hide the body until dark. Yes, you would. But where, Rupert? Yes... Yes, where? Cat and mouse! Cat and mouse! Philip! Only which is the cat and which is the mouse? That's enough of that. Mind your own business. That's enough, Philip! I told you before, mind your own business! It really isn't any of my business. I'm not his keeper. With him in this condition, though, there doesn't seem to be much point in your saying, Rupert. That is, unless you came back to find something besides your cigarette case. You mean, for example, to find if you really got rid of David? Yes, that's what I mean. Oh, you're as romantic as Janet. I don't think for a moment that you kidnapped David. Oh, I will admit Janet put the notion in my head, but I never would have mentioned it if it weren't that you seem to be carrying fear of discovery in your pocket. What? That's a gun you've got there in your pocket, isn't it? That teased my suspicions more than anything else, and to tell you the truth, really scares me a little. (laughs) I'm terribly sorry, Rupert. I don't blame you, but, well, here... You can relax. I have to take it up to the country. There have been several burglaries, and Mother's a bit on edge. Finish there, Philip? Philip, did you hear what Rupert said about the gun? (laughs) It's odd the way one can pyramid simple facts into wild fantasies, isn't it? We all do, don't we, Philip? Yeah. Particularly after a few drinks. How was your drink, Rupert? I think I'll be running along. Philip, you'll feel much better once you get out into the open air. I don't think there will be much traffic, and we ought to make good time. It's a lovely night, and you'll be driving up in good weather. I almost wish I were going with you. It might be rather exciting. Driving at night always is, but driving with you and Philip now might have an additional element of suspense. You are right, Philip. Those books were tied clumsily. The rope. He's got it. He's got the rope! Philip! He knows, he knows, he knows! All right, Philip, easy. I'll take care of it. No, you won't. I'd just as soon kill you as kill him. Sooner! Philip, put that gun down. This is what you wanted. Somebody else to know. Somebody else to see how brilliant you are, just like in school. I told you he'd find out, but oh no! You had to have him here. And now we're done for! Shut up! Put that gun down! You made me do it. And I hate the both of you for it! I was- Give me the gun. (laughs) Stupid babbling drunk. I'm sorry, Rupert. Are you okay? Yes. Yes, it's all right. If you really want to kill, you don't miss. Not at that range. Of course he didn't want to kill you. He doesn't know what he was doing, any more than he knew what he was saying. He's becoming an alcoholic. Rupert. Brandon, will you step over there, please? Philip's drunk, Rupert. Surely you don't take those nightmare ideas of his seriously. Brandon. Brandon, I'm tired. And in a way, I'm frightened too. But I don't want a fence anymore. What are you going to do? I don't want to, but I'm going to look inside that chest. 
Are you crazy? I hope so. With all my heart, I hope I'm crazy. Rupert, this has nothing to do with you. I've got to. Don't! I have to look inside that chest. All right! Go ahead and look. I hope you'll like what you see. Oh, no. No. David! Rupert! I couldn't believe it was true. Rupert, please. Please what? Listen to me. Just listen. Let me explain. Explain? Do you think you could explain that? Your friend is dead. Yes, to you. I can because you'll understand. Understand? Rupert, remember the discussion we had before with Mr. Kentley? Remember when we said the lives of inferior beings are unimportant? Remember, we said, we've always said, you and I, that moral concepts of good and evil and right and wrong don't hold for the intellectually superior. You remember, Rupert? Yes, I remember. That's all we've done. That's all Philip and I have done. He and I have lived what you and I have talked. I knew you understand. Because you have to, don't you see? You have to. Brandon, till this very moment, this world and the people in it have always been dark and incomprehensible to me. I've tried to clear my way with logic and superior intellect. And you've thrown my own words right back in my face, Brandon. You were right, too. If nothing else, a man should stand by his words. But you've given my words a meaning that I never dreamed of. And you've tried to twist them into a cold, logical excuse for your ugly murder. Well, they never were that, Brandon, and you can't make them that. There must have been something deep inside you from the very start that let you do this thing. But there's always been something deep inside me that would never let me do it. And would never let me be a party to it now. What do you mean? I mean that tonight you've made me ashamed of every concept I ever had of superior or inferior beings. But I thank you for that shame. Because now I know that we are each of us a separate human being. With the right to live and work and think as individuals but with an obligation to the society we live in. By what right do you dare say that there's a superior few to which you belong? By what right do you dare decide that the boy in there was inferior and therefore could be killed? Do you think you were God, Brandon? Is that what you thought when you choked the life out of him? Is that what you thought when you served food from his grave? I don't know what you thought or what you are, but I know what you've done. You've murdered. You've strangled a fellow human being who could live and love as you never could. And never will again. What are you doing? It's not what I'm going to do. It's what society is going to do. I don't know what that will be. I can guess. And I can help. Why are you opening the window? I'm alerting the police. And that concludes tonight's presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Our performance of Alfred Hitchcock's classic film noir, Rope, starring the Smog Show players. We hope you enjoyed our program. 
I'm Olson Smells. Till next time, good evening. There we go. Wow. That's it. There you have it. It's so funny because people that are, that just finished listening to it, uh, hearing this outro, you know, they've been listening for an hour, but we've only been sitting here for a couple minutes because we just had to, <laughs> that's the beauty of podcasting. You just drag in the file and then you record the outro. So we recorded the intro like a couple minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. Well, we were been in the studio for four months. Yeah, that's true. Doing that. I guess that I don't want to there. reveal all the magic. <laughs> yeah, the magic that happens. Yeah. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I had fun doing it a lot. It's a lot of work. And hey, yeah, kudos to Allie. Allie did a lot, pretty much did all of the vocal editing, all the um, the people talking, you know? Well, pretty much all editing is so tedious. I mean, and there's things that, like little victories that you and I celebrate, like, oh, wow, that really pieced together like really nicely that no one else notices. And that means we were successful because if no one else hears it, you know, mm-hmm. like, because some of the editing, I mean, it's like, you know, someone may have stumbled over a word, but then they reread part of the line. So what you have to do is you have to piece like a couple words from their sentence when they recorded it this time, but then you have to go to another time when they reread it. You're piecing together two different sentences into one or sometimes, you know, forming one word, like half of one word with another half of the, just to, you know, piece it together. And if it sounds seamless and no one notices it, then... That means we did our job. <laughs> and that's not to say that there are little, little quirks and little mistakes here and there. And at some point you say, good enough. But you know what really makes me think about when we're doing this, we're thinking when this, when they used to do these live back in the mm-hmm. day, they did it in one take. And then that's was great acting. They were able to continue if they made any mistake yeah. and you really didn't know. But to, well, I think they also rehearsed and rehearsed and rehearsed before they went live too. That's true too. But even the sound effects uh, team, oh, I know. you know, layering those in live. I mean, that's just incredible. And here we are, tedi- you know, tedious uh, oversight for four months. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a lot of different, you know, forms of art, you know, and like, you know, we face challenges that we're different than going live and people going live face different challenges, but all of it, it's just different creative processes, but it's pretty amazing what you can just do in today's day and age also. Right. Okay. Well, I think we're, <laughs> I think we've had enough today. I think people are uh, ready to move on in, with their day, but uh, we appreciate you coming here. Hey, Holly, why don't you kick off? Uh, I don't know. What is it? Number seven. Number yeah, I want seven? you to number seven, All right. please. All right, kick it up there. There we go. That's a uh, fancy talk for, um, that's code for which what I press on the soundboard here. Yeah. Hey, um, just so that you know, if you haven't checked out, <clears throat> excuse me, a frog in my throat. <laughs> checked out a frog if in If you throat? haven't checked out smorgshow.com in a while, you may want to head over there. We are doing a complete relaunch of the program and the branding. And I think it's looking really cool. Uh, we've been working with a design studio who made the uh, uh, new logo for us. We really like the artwork. Uh, but more importantly, I've just got the creative itch again, and I think we're going to be doing these more regularly in the new year. So, hey. That creative itch is going to be scratched. That's right. Oh, wow. <laughs> I just. Wow. You know, ironically, I created a new end, a shorter ending for our closing theme <laughs> because it used to go on for like two minutes. I thought, you know what? We might want to make it a little more uh, Concise. concise. And here I am being verbose. So Hey, that's a good word. <laughs> anyway, uh, smorgshow.com. Uh, everything is still working. 31295 smorg. And the email is, uh, <clears throat> man, yeah, f- feedback at smorgshowpodcast.com. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks to the Smorg Show players for this great episode. And uh, that's it. I think we're going to sign off. Okay. Thanks. <laughs>